welcome the inimitable and absolutely amazing Mahabanu Modi Kotwal, who will share her comic insight on single women, divorce, and women in general. Mahabanu is an internationally acclaimed producer, director, and stage and screenwrite actor. She has received the Karam Veer Puraskar Award for her unparalleled contribution and success in using art towards social justice. One cannot mention Mahabanu and not her famous play, The Vagina Monologues. Mahabanu Kotwal, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is going to be a different kind of talk than what you've heard before. <laughs> uh, when I say ladies and gentlemen, considering the social and political climate in our country, I hope that includes all of you in the audience. <laughs> you know, actually, I'm extremely thrilled to be here today. We know that women all over the world are not treated equally. Why? Only because they are women. But in India, like all things, we add an extra degree of difficulty to things which are already unbearable. I'm always reminded of this little verse I once read when I was thinking about my fellow Indian women. And it went, a woman stood at the heavenly gates. Her face was scarred and old. She stood before the man of fate for permission to the fold. What have you done, St. Peter asked, to gain admission here? I was born in India, sir, she said, and lived there for many and many a year. The pearly gate swung open wide. St. Peter touched the bell. Come in and choose your harp, he said. You have had your share of hell. <laughs> and speaking, <laughs> speaking of hell, Marriage is not far behind in India, right? <laughs> Wedding, courtship, finding the right maid, then realizing he's not the right one. You know, it's a hellish experience, believe me. Well, in addition to coming here to address all of you, I'm also here to attend the wedding of a friend of mine who is one of Delhi's very famous socialites. This is her fourth wedding. Uh, but. About a month ago, she asked me to come out here and help her uh, choose out her wedding gown or whatever it was that she was going to wear. So both of us trotted up to Delhi's most famous designer, and uh, the designer was thrilled, you know, that she had this beautiful woman wanting to have him design her dress. And he said, why don't you tell me what you would like, because uh, it will give me an idea of how I could go about doing this wonderful dress for you. And she said, well, you know, it has got to be pristine white. That's how she said it. She said, it's got to be pristine white. It's got to have lots of frills and flounces. And make sure that you get your hands on every single Savarovsky crystal that you can find on this planet and encrust the gown with it. So the designer was taken back a bit. He said... What you would uh, describe is wonderful, you know, it's really wonderful, but uh, I think it's meant for somebody a little younger, somebody who's getting married for the first time. In short, somebody who's a virgin. <laughs> well, <laughs> Rita was absolutely furious. She says, how dare you say I'm not a virgin? So the designer was taken aback. He said, but ma'am, you've been married twice. She said, yes, you know what happened the first time I got married? And the designer said, no, but tell me. <laughs> and she said, well, the first time I got married, I got married to this real big man from the RSS party. And apart from his khaki chaddis, which annoyed me no end, he was so old that when we went to the wedding reception from the wedding ceremony, he just keeled over in the car and died. <laughs> so the, uh, the designer was suitably contrite, and he said, I'm very sorry to hear that, but you were married uh, twice after that. She said, yes, you know what happened the second time I got married? The second time I got married, I got married to this real big gun, pun intended, from the Shiv Sena. <laughs> so, and, uh, you know, she said, um, on the way to the wedding reception in the car, we got into this violent fight, and we had the wedding an annulled. So... Uh, the 
the designer said that you were married for quite some time, the third time. She said, yes, you know what happened the third time I got married? The third time I got married, I got married to this real big man from the BJP. Every night for three years, he would sit at the edge of the bed and tell me, Ache <laughs> dinayenge. Yeah, politicians, what can you say about them, I tell you? Uh, and you know, our politicians get very excited when a fo foreign film star comes here and has uh, a wedding performed or, you know, whatever. This happened a few years ago. A lady by the name of an actor, by the name of Liz Hurley, decided to hold her wedding nuptials in a city called Jodhpur in Rajasthan. And the Rajasthan government went into orgasmic ecstasy that she had bestowed this kind of uh, an honor on them. So in order to repay the honor and to reward her for her generous act, they requested the center to replace the letter J in the city's name with the letters CH. <laughs> Shall we say a little a joke for the, that just died? <laughs> uh, anyway. I'll wait a moment till it registers to all of you. <laughs> well, anyway, that marriage didn't last long. <laughs> no marriage does these days. But you know, marriage is like the Indo-Pak problem. There's no solution. You jiggle things around a bit. You give a little bit here. You take a little bit there. But most of the time, you just hold your head down, observe the curfew, and hope that ceasefire holds. And mostly, Mostly, according to me, it's the fault of the men. Oh, they're lovely at first, you know, when they're courting you, before you've had that horizontal party with them. Ah, oh, they're marvelous, they'll do anything for you. But the very minute they've had you, the very minute you've had that party with them, the behavior starts to change. Reminds me of that advertisement on television the other night, the Cadbury milk tray man. Ah, oh, you see him diving off a thousand foot cliff and swimming through miles of raging water only to deliver this little box of chocolates to his lady love. And from that you learn that the lady loves the Cadbury milk tray chocolates. You also learn that the lady's been keeping her legs firmly closed. Because if she hadn't, if he'd had his way with her and she'd had that party with him, he wouldn't go there diving off a thousand foot cliff and swimming through miles of water. No, he'd go by bus. And there'd be no more chocolates. And if she happened to mention the chocolates he used to bring her, he'd say, no, Mona, darling, no more chocolates for you. You're just putting on too much weight, babe. <laughs> you know, come to think of it, all these fancy perfume and chocolate companies that have sprung up these days, they'd go out of business if we women didn't hold back a bit. No, I'm not a feminist. I don't hate men. I'm not a feminist. Not like Aruna, my best friend. Now, she's a feminist. Why? Because she reads Cosmopolitan and she says all men are potential rapists, even the Pope. <laughs> well, Aruna does hate men, you know. She's divorced, she's a nurse. Apparently, she came home one morning after her night shift and found him in bed with the milkman. Honest to God, the Dugavala. And from that day forward, she was a feminist. And you know something? I notice she never takes milk with her tea. So ultimately, it all boils down to sex, doesn't it? Everything in life boils down to sex. I think sex is highly overrated, like the Indian parliament. It's just a lot of shoving and pushing, and you still end up with very little in the end. Now, mind you, if I had been born into the next generation, the millennials, it would be different, isn't it? Because they discovered it. You see, they discovered the word sex, clitoris, vagina, but when I was young, I'd never even heard of these words. I thought in those days, everything was in, out, in, out. You shake it all about, and the sky would light up, and the earth would tremble. Choroji, the only thing that trembled for me was the headboard on my bed. <laughs> but you see, I'd never heard those words before. And it was all the fault of this one man called Freud. You heard of Sigmund Freud? I call him Sigmund Freud. Because he went around telling people that women could have two kinds of orgasms. The main orgasm and, uh, well, the inferior one. I mean, it's amazing, isn't it? 
telling us women that there are two kinds of orgasms. It's like telling women there are two Mount Everests. Some lucky ones stumble onto the real mountain. But most of us, we are just climbing this little hill, this little tegri, and wondering why the view isn't so great when we reach the top. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he totally misled us, didn't he? But enough about that. Now I'm going to talk about entrepreneurship, which is, I believe, one of the topics of today. <laughs> I must say, and this is for you, madam, that the government's plan to encourage small entrepreneurs, especially women from Gujarat, has led to some stunning new startups. My friend Harsa Ben from Ahmedabad has actually st set the state on, state on fire, well, in a good way, uh, with her latest idea. The following testimony is from a woman who represents her, Varsa Ben, and Varsa Ben has a special selling pitch that she gives, you know, you need to contact her and get her to come and talk about it to your group. <laughs> so I am going to tell you verbatim what Varsa Ben says. She says, about a month ago, I was shown some products designed to improve the sex life of Indian women. <laughs> Hare, I got so excited, so I thought I had to come out here and tell you about it. You see, to look at me, you would never suspect that I was a semi-non-orgasmic woman. <laughs> what it means is, it's possible for me to have sex, but highly unlikely. <laughs> to me, the term sexual freedom means freedom from having to have sex. <laughs> and then along came this, this big startup project called Good Vibrations. Uh, and I was so surprised. Now I'm the brand ambassador for Sila Ki Jawani and Munni Ki Badnami all rolled into one package. <laughs> As a love object, it surpasses my husband Har Haris Bhai, Harry for sort, uh, by a country mile. But please, it is no, no threat to the Indian family unit. Think of it as a kind of instant chatpata chat masala for the bedroom. Can you afford one, you are asking me? And I am asking you, can you afford not to have one? <laughs> Why, the time it saves alone is worth the price. <laughs> Hare Hanji, I would rank it right up there with Botox and Patanjali's instant noodles. <laughs> Ladies, it simply takes the guesswork out of having to have sex. But doesn't it kill romance, you are asking? And I am asking, what doesn't? So, ladies, what will it be? Would you like a deluxe kit or a little purse size model for the Indian woman on the go? <laughs> the purse size model fills anywhere and comes with its own silencer to prevent curious onlookers. <laughs> Gentlemen, it can make a wonderful gift, a delightful gift for the busy, much harried, busy Indian housewife who has 1,001 chores and simply does not need the extra burden of trying to have an orgasm. <laughs> but what about guilt, you are asking me? And that thought did cross my mind. But you know, at one time, we Indian women, we used to feel guilty about using cake mix instead of baking from scratch. <laughs> we learned to live with that. We can certainly live to with this one, <laughs> right? Well, that's as far as entrepreneurship goes. <laughs> uh, and now I have something very personal to say. I have to make a confession. And my, my, uh, my psychiatrist tells me that unless I do it out in front of uh, a large crowd, I'll never be cured. You see, the problem is that I'm, I'm the only person in the state of Maharashtra, and uh, Mumbai in particular, who is not a model. I mean, look at me, you know. But I have told my psychiatrist I cannot understand the world of these beautiful women. I mean, uh, have you noticed these ramp models, they never smile. Have you noticed that? I mean, what's with this duck build Botox pout? <laughs> I mean, come on, ladies, if these utterly, ridiculously overpriced and undersized clothes don't make you happy, maybe they're not for you. <sighs> And you know something? If you get up in the morning 
and you open the paper and you see a woman, a picture of a woman holding a cup of coffee in her hand, you know, uh, publicizing a brand, and she's looking at it like this. Would you say to yourself, yes, I'll go out and get six packs of this. I want to look as unhappy as she does. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't do that, would you? And the only thing these girls should be advertising are antidepressants. That also for the before picture. <laughs> and then there's that silly little strut that they do, you know, that reeks of over-lubricated ball and socket hip joints. Or are they trying to keep their anal suppositories in place? I mean, you see a woman walking down like that on the road and you say to yourself, poor thing, you know, this woman needs to be locked up and the keys thrown away. Or if you're pr kind, like the way I am, you would say, poor thing, her hemorrhoids must be itching terribly. <laughs> and then why can't they make up their minds whether they're going or coming? You notice they come onto the ramp, the lips come before they do, <laughs> but they come onto the ramp, walk five uh, steps ahead, turn around, walk back, as if they've forgotten something in the dressing room, which considering the state of undress they are in, perhaps they have, but they come on again, come seven steps forward, five steps backwa backwards, six steps forwards, two steps backwards, goes on and on and on, ad infinitum, ad nauseum. And what, what surprises me is, have you noticed? Our male models have bigger breasts than the females do. <laughs> but the one thing, the one thing that I have never been able to understand and listen very carefully, why do our male models wear their pants so tight you can tell their religion? <laughs> okay, I think that's another joke that just died. <laughs> okay, you know, before I sign off, uh, I was in Geneva a few weeks ago. Uh, there was a conference of very high-powered women. I was not one of them, I was in the audience. And uh, the organizers, I believe, had invited uh, entries for an, an international women's anthem. And don't worry, you don't have to stand up. Uh, <laughs> so I am going to, re even the music has not yet been, uh, s the, it has not been set to music yet. Maybe somebody will. Uh, I'm going to read out the anthem to you. We shave our legs and we sit down to pee. And we can justify any shopping spree. We don't go to a barber but a beauty salon, and we can get a massage without getting a hard on. <laughs> we can balance our checkbooks and pump our own gas and talk to our friends about the size of our ass. We don't lose our hair and we won't get jock itch, and when we don't sleep with you, don't call us that bitch. Flowers are okay, but jewelry's best. Would you please look at my face and not at my chest? We don't have a problem expressing our feelings. And we know when you're lying because you're looking at the ceiling. Don't call us dames, babes, or chicks. We are women. Get it, you pricks? Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mahabanu. I'm still holding my sides after.